Today we're going to look at lenses and mirrors. In just about all of physics there are conventions and this is no different. Here for example all distances are measured from the optical element which would be the lens or the mirror. In practically everything we're going to do we'll only have one optical element. We can start with the simplest possible mirror which is a flat one. This is like bathroom mirrors. Uh, the things that are important here, how far away uh, is the object from the mirror and how far away is the image from the mirror. In some books you'll see these things written as O for object distance and sometimes P for object distance and I for image distance. Your book makes what I think is a little better choice and uses DO and DI. For a plane mirror we have a very simple rule and that is DO equals negative DI. <clears throat> this means if you're standing 1.5 meters in front of the mirror DO is 1.5, your image will appear to be 1.5 meters behind the mirror. The negative sign means the image is virtual, and we can extract a couple of things from that virtual image. This also means it can't be projected, so you can't hold an index card up beside your head and see what's in the mirror being projected on the index card. It, for a mirror, means that the image is on the opposite side of the mirror from the object. When you're standing looking at the bathroom mirror, there is nothing behind the mirror except wallboard and wood. There's not any light coming from that. That's what also makes it a virtual mirror. Uh, finally, as long as we only have a single optical element, DO will always be positive. There's one interesting problem that comes up in every physics book, and that is what's the minimum height for a mirror that will allow you to see your entire body. Uh, it doesn't change anything, but it does make the the uh, image easier to understand if we imagine your eyes are at the very top of your head. Usually when people try and answer this question they feel like it depends on how far away you are from the mirror that you could back up and see more of yourself in it but that doesn't actually happen. The answer that you get when you do this is half of your height. If you imagine the top of the mirror is the same height as the top of your head which is where we've put your eyes you can look straight out to see the top and then using the law of reflection, if you need to look at your feet, you'd look halfway down your height and the reflection would carry it down the rest of the way so that you could see your feet. One time a student asked me a very interesting question. If you have some, you know, you could have a small hand mirror and look in it and see the entire moon. The question was if someone on the moon had a giant telescope, which we, we don't have one this big, but we could in principle build one, if those people on the moon could look with this telescope over your shoulder, would they see the entire moon in your mirror and therefore their entire body in a mirror that's much smaller than half their height? I won't tell you the answer to this because it's much more fun for you to figure it out for yourself. Find a pair of binoculars, borrow one if you don't own one, and get a small mirror and see how much of your head you can see in it close up and then start backing away from it and use the binoculars and see if you can see more or less of your head in the mirror. Now an example that's more involved than the plane mirror but still not too bad is a spherical mirror. Imagine you have one of these shiny Christmas ornaments, this basically just a shiny ball. Uh, instead of breaking it, let's say we just cut out a little circular segment of it. This would be a spherical mirror. If we use this one, notice it's shiny on the inside, that would give us a concave spherical mirror. If the outside, instead of being red, had been left unpainted so that it was shiny and we use the outside, that would be a convex spherical mirror. There are really only two things we need to know about a spherical mirror. One is concave or convex, and the other one is radius of curvature. This is not the size of the small circle that you would cut out of the of the Christmas ball, it's the radius of the ball itself. That's the radius of curvature. For this thing it's probably two or three centimeters because it's probably five or six centimeters across. If we assume we have a concave mirror with a radius of curvature R and we shine parallel light on it, we know that the light spreads out in all directions, so where are we going to get the parallel light for this? First we can imagine here's our point source lights going out in all directions and we've got a sheet of paper reasonably close to our source. Notice that the light rays that hit the bottom and the top of the paper start off very far apart in angle, practically 90 degrees. On the other hand, if we move the paper very far away from the light source, now the rays that hit the top and the bottom of the paper 
have a much smaller angle separating them. You can probably guess that in the limit that we move the source and the paper infinitely far apart, the two rays would start out parallel to each other. So that's where we get parallel light. We get infinitely far away from a point source. Now, of course, since we can't do that in reality, it turns out that very far on the scale of other lengths in the problem, that's good enough for it to be infinite. Now that we have our source of parallel light, the sun is an obvious choice, what happens if we shine that light at a concave mirror? Well, what we notice about this, the normal is constantly changing as we move around this mirror, but it's always pointing at what would be the center of the Christmas tree ornament. That's what this dotted green line indicates. That radius is shown here. We could figure out what's going to happen to this incident light because we know the law of reflection. We know that when light hits at some angle to this green dotted line, it will bounce away at the same angle. This, when light comes in parallel on this mirror, we're going to say right now all the light gets reflected to this same point. We're going to see this isn't exactly right and we'll have to fix it, but for right now it's close enough. The point where this happens is half of R away from the mirror. So it's in between this point and this point. This point where all the parallel light rays come together is called the focus, and the distance from the mirror to that point is the focal length. Once we know this for a mirror, it never changes. We could stamp it on the outside of the mirror if we wanted to. It turns out this is also equal to half of R, where R is our radius of curvature again. So we can write F equals R over 2. We further define F as being positive for a concave mirror, like we've drawn here, or negative for a convex mirror. The concave mirror is also called a converging mirror because you notice it's bringing the light down to a point. The convex mirror is also called diverging because it's making the light spread out when it hits. Notice if you track the reflected rays back in the case of the diverging mirror, they all come together at a point that is half of R away from the mirror. This is our focal point again. Your eye always tracks the light back along what it thinks is the straight line that it traveled. We could figure all this out using ray tracing. All this does, we use Snell's law and the law of reflection, and we can go through any number of lenses or mirrors and trace these light rays and see where they're going. And this is a miserable way to find out what your image is going to look like. It's an easy way to get a computer to understand it because it's simple and tedious and you just apply it over and over and over again. What's a lot easier to do is look at the geometry and then figure out the thin lens equation. This is done in your book. This is one of really only two equations we're going to need. This connects the focal length of the mirror to the object distance and the image distance and we can write it like this. This tells us right away where the plane mirror formula would come from. If we have a flat mirror, we could say that's an infinite radius of curvature. So we would have f is infinite, and the left side of this equation would tend to 0. We solve it, and we get d0, or do, equals negative di. We're going to do something that's really not mathematically uh, justified, but it's fine for what we're doing because we're not really ever going to be dealing with infinite distances. We know that 1 over something very small is very large, 1 over something very large is very small. So we will say 1 over 0 is infinity and 1 over infinity is 0. If we set our source distance to be infinite, meaning we've got light coming from infinitely far away, this term will disappear and we'll get that the focal length is equal to the image distance. The image distance is where the light rays come together by definition. There's one more useful equation, and that tells us about magnification, or how big is the image compared to the object size. We can write this in terms of variables h, o, and h, i for object and image height. If we use ray tracing and the geometry of triangles, we could figure out that the magnification is the negative of the image distance over the object distance, or equivalently the image height over the object height. To interpret what that means, there are a couple of rules. If the magnification is less than zero, we would say the image is inverted relative to the object. 
if the magnification is greater than zero, the object and image are in the same orientation. If the absolute value of M is greater than one, that means the image is larger than the object. If the absolute value of M is less than one, the image is smaller than the object. For example, if we had a mirror with a focal length of 0.5 meters, and that's positive, the positive sign tells us it's a concave mirror. If we put an object 1.5 meters away from it, we can calculate, using the thin lens equation, that our image will be 0.75 meters away from it. We then use the magnification equation, and we get magnification of negative 0.5. Notice this is dimensionless since it's the ratio of two distances. We know this image is real since di is greater than zero. We could project it on a screen. It's inverted or upside down relative to the object since m is less than zero. And it's smaller than the object since the absolute value of m is less than one. Let's start moving the object closer in and watch what happens to our numbers. When we get into 0.75 meters, we solve the thin lens equation and we get di is 1.5 meters, m is negative 2. This means a real image because di is positive. It's inverted because m is less than 0 and it's larger than the object because the absolute value of m is greater than 1. If we move the object to 0.5 meters, one focal length away, we get that di approaches infinity, so there is no image, and we get parallel light out of the mirror. This would be a good way to design a flashlight. We put this mirror, this concave mirror, behind the bulb this far back, one focal length back, and we get a nice parallel beam coming out. If we keep moving closer, we get to 0.25 meters. The image distance is now negative 0.5 meters. Our magnification is now plus 2. This means we have a virtual image since di is less than zero. It's upright since m is greater than zero, and it's larger than the object since the absolute value of m is greater than one. You can try this out with an ordinary spoon because it will act like this. Very far away, you'll see an image of yourself upside down and small. You get closer and closer, and then suddenly you flip upright, and it starts to be magnified. This is the way shaving mirrors and makeup mirrors work. If we try the same thing with a diverging mirror, a convex mirror, we take f equals negative 0.5 and again start 1.5 meters away. We do the math and we get an image distance of negative 0.375 meters, so our magnification is positive 0.25. We have a virtual image because it's negative image distance. It's upright since m is greater than 0 and it's smaller than the object since absolute value of m is less than 1. As we start moving closer in, object distance 0.75 meters, the image distance is negative 0.3, our magnification is plus 0.4. Still a virtual image, still upright, still smaller than the object. We keep moving in, object distance of 0.5 meters, image negative 0.25, magnification plus 0.5. Still virtual, still upright, still smaller than the object. Finally, we get much closer at 0.25 meters. Image distance is negative 0.1667 meters, so the magnification is plus two-thirds. The image is still virtual, upright, and smaller than the object. We never had an image flip here because all the images are virtual if you just have a single diverging mirror. Also, the image is always smaller than the object, and what this means, and this should sound familiar, objects in mirror are closer than they appear they look smaller than they really are. You see the same thing in the anti-shoplifting mirrors in convenience stores. If you're trying to fit the entire store into this tiny little one or two square foot window that you're looking into, you have to make it smaller than it really is if you want it to fit.